It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker. On Monday, the government tried to pass off service cuts on the UP Express as an improvement. By Tuesday, they were shamed into reversing this decision. That's a record-breaking reversal even for this government. <laughs> They clearly don't consult people in the community, or they would know that this impact was going to have, uh, be huge on Order. people trying to get to work uh, from these neighbourhoods. It's hard to think of an announcement that this government hasn't had to reverse in shame, uh, Speaker. But my question to the Premier is, has his government considered talking to people who actually use transit to get to work instead of their million-dollar man, Phil Verster? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, on Monday we launched the largest GO expansion in over a decade, Mr. Speaker. Ah. A 15 percent increase in weekly trips, 300 new weekly trips for trains and for commuters across many lines, whether that's Lakeshore West, East, Stouffville Line, the Kitchener Line, Mr. Speaker. This is our government's commitment to get people moving. And of course, the NDP wouldn't support that, Mr. Speaker. Of course, just like the previous Liberal government for 15 years did absolutely nothing on public transit, I expect nothing less than when we launch the largest expansion of GoRail Transit in the next in, in over a decade, that they would oppose that, Mr. Speaker, just like they've opposed every one of our investments into public transit and getting people moving faster. So we will continue to invest in public service, increase services across our networks. Supplementary question. Well, the truth is, uh, Speaker, this is just another example of this government ignoring uh, transit riders and ignoring workers in the Bloor Western community. There are 82 Metrolinx vice presidents on the latest Sunshine list. 82. The Premier gave the Metrolinx CEO a 65 percent raise while he was still fighting to keep teachers and education workers and other public sector workers at 1 percent. He went to court over that. Even with all of these high-paid executives, Metrolinx still can't say when the Eglinton Crosstown P3 is going to open. So my question is, why does the Premier keep rewarding Metrolinx for failing to deliver for the people of Bloor Weston? Mr. Transportation. Mr. Speaker, let's recap what the NDP and Liberals have voted against on public transit, the largest investment in North America on public transit. The NDP and Liberals have voted against the Ontario Line. The NDP and Liberals have voted Order. against the expansion of GO Transit like we have here today, uh, uh, infrastructure improvements that support the expansion of 300 new trips per week, Mr. Speaker. They voted against the West Extension uh, that we just announced the RFQ uh, process on a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Speaker. They have voted against the Scarborough Subway Extension. Mr. Wow. Speaker, on the Eglinton Crosstown West projects. Extension, when that is built, it is going to take over six million cars off the road. And guess what? The Liberals and NDP have opposed Order. that. The record on public uh, transit is horrible, Mr. Speaker. Our government has a mandate to build and to get people moving, and that's exactly what we are doing when we are putting these investments forward. Order. The final supplementary. Speaker, actually, the official opposition, we believe that people going to work deserve reliable and affordable transit. And you know what? That is why we in the NDP had to fight to integrate the UP Express into communities after the Liberals envisioned it as just this boutique line. People don't want a government that's actively making their lives harder by just recklessly changing their transit routes overnight. Had the minister spoken to a single commuter, a single commuter, he wouldn't have even put this forward. Why does this government keep putting forward policies without consulting a single person impacted by their decisions? Once again, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, reliable transit, affordable transit. I want to ask the member from both the NDP and Liberals, why did you vote against one fare? $1,600 order. of savings wow. for communities. Member for Waterloo, come to order. My colleague, Minister Thanagasim, 
why would you vote against one fair one integration fair. of transit services across this province? Why are you going to vote against 300 new trips on the Hamilton Mountain and Kendall Kendall transit expansion, the largest expansion in over a decade, Mr. Speaker? Your record on public transit is embarrassing. Our government is getting it done. We're building transit. We're investing in public transit, $70 billion over the next 10 years, when the previous Liberal government failed to do so. We're making it more affordable, Mr. Speaker, and I hope the NDP and Liberal will support this government's investments in uh, public transit. I know. They, they have it, and that's a shame. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, speaking of another government policy that's making life harder for people in this province, the government is letting for-profit clinics take advantage of the millions of Ontarians who are struggling to find primary care. More and more we're hearing about clinics that are breaking the law, Speaker, by charging patients to see a doctor. Yesterday, the Ontario Health Coalition released a report with the stories of over 100 uh, patients who were unfairly and illegally charged to see a doctor. The Minister of Health herself has acknowledged that the province can take action to stop this predatory practice, but has chosen not to. Yeah. Has chosen not to. Why has this government chosen to sit back instead of taking action to protect patients? Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Bend. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario is leading the country with 90% of Ontarians having a family doctor or primary health provider. The Ontario Health Coalition is an out-of-touch, NDP-backed special interest group that has spent the last decade ideologically opposed to innovation taking place in our health care system. Speaker, our government is taking bold action to connect more people to the care they need when they need it. Over the last year, we have increased publicly funded diagnostic imaging capacity by an additional 97,000 MRIs and 116,000 CT operating hours. Speaker, adding tens of thousands of OHIP-covered cataract surgeries and achieved some of the shortest wait times in Canada. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Bold action, Speaker. Bold action. What this government has done is they've written a letter. A letter. A letter. That's all they've done. That's not action. That's the very bare minimum of what a government could and should do for the people of this province. Order. Not only are these clinics charging patients thousands of dollars just to get through the door, but patients are also being misled and upsold. It's illegal, and these clinics are knowingly breaking the law because they're giving the because they've been given the green light by the light by this minister to expand in Ontario. Now she's pretending that there's nothing she can do about it except for writing a letter, and that is pathetic, Speaker. Why won't this government show some leadership to stop this predatory practice once and for all? Members will take their seat. Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, and the member for Ottawa South will please come to order. Response: The member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Our government will not tolerate clinics taking advantage of a loophole created by federal legislation. As echoed by Minister Jones and other ministers of health across the co country at our annual uh, federal, provincial, territorial meeting of health ministers this past November, this lack of a prohibition has created a loophole that health care, certain health care providers and their clinics are taken advantage of, knowing there is no legal consequence or risk of getting shut down. We look forward to working with, together with the provincial, territorial and federal governments to ensure that this loophole is closed. Thank you, Speaker. And the final supplementary, back to the Leader of the Opposition. Well, let me be very clear with the, uh, the government, and, and I'm going to ask this question to the Premier again. We're seeing the expansion of these so-called executive health clinics that provide primary care only to patients who are willing to pay really hefty fees. Uh, we saw this starting under the Liberal government, but it has totally taken off under this government. These for-profit clinics are taking advantage of the primary care crisis that has left 2.4 million patients in this province without a primary care physician. So my question to the Premier is, again, when will this government address for-profit clinics that are taking advantage of worried and anxious patients in this province? Members will please take their seats. 
The Parliamentary Assistance Minister Tom. Speaker, through Bill 60, our government has further strengthened the oversight of community surgical and diagnostic centres by bringing these centres under the oversight of a patient ombudsman. We have strengthened our laws to ensure that Ontarians will always access insured services at community surgical and diagnostic centres with their OHIP card, never their credit card. Our plan is adding thousands of hours of MRI and CTV scans and more procedures, including hip knee replacements closer to home, all accessible with their OHIP card, not their credit card. Our plan has already reduced the surgical backlog to below pre-pandemic level. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, speaker, this question is for the Premier. Three years ago, the federal government designated the proposed Highway 413 for a federal environmental assessment. That assessment would have given the public and decision makers accurate information about the impacts but also the costs of this highway that runs through the Greenbelt, a project that we already know is planned only for this government's friends with benefits. If we can't get this information through an environmental assessment, Speaker, maybe the Premier will finally tell us here. To the Premier, how much will Highway 413 cost Ontario taxpayers? Yeah. Mr. Transportation. Mr. Speaker, Highway 413 is a generational investment into infrastructure across this province, Mr. Speaker. We're investing $28 billion over the next 10 years, whether it's Highway 413, the Bradford Bypass, Highway 11 and 17. I urge that member and the Liberals to get out of the Queen's Park bubble, get onto the roads of Milton, of Brampton, Order. of Mississauga, of Vaughan, and see firsthand the gridlock and the necessity for this project. Flashback to June 2, 2022, Mr. Speaker, when this government Order. received one of the largest majority governments based off their commitment and promise to build 413, and we will get shovels in the ground. Member from Waterloo will come to order. The supplementary question. You know what is generational, Speaker? It's going to cost generations of Ontarians to pay the foot the bill for that. That's what that that minister won't share with Ontarians. Order. The government's expert panel said Highway 413 would save drivers only 30 to 60 seconds per trip. The same experts said that if this government used Highway 407 better, it would solve Order. the problem. But when the NDP put forward a solution to relieve the burden of tolls for trucks on the 407, the Conservatives said no. This Premier won't even say how much this highway through the Greenbelt is going to cost the taxpayers of Ontario, so I want to know why is the Premier ignoring solutions that would save drivers money and time today? in favour of a project that will only be complete in decades and has no price tag. Members will take their seats. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The member for Kitchener, Conestoga will come to order. Pardon me. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I urge both the Liberals and NDP to talk to the people of Milton, talk to the people of Mississauga, talk to the people of Brampton, of Vaughan, Mr. Speaker. This is going to make a significant difference in commuting for all of them. Over 30 minutes saved each direction, Mr. Speaker, per order. We have seen over a million people come into this province in the last two years. The NDP and Liberals have opposed every project that we have put forward, whether that's public transit or whether that's building highways, Mr. Speaker. This highway will support 3,500 good paying jobs, have an impact of over $350 million to their GDP, Mr. Speaker. We need to continue building infrastructure for 15 years. We saw what the Liberals did. Absolutely nothing, Mr. Speaker. They cancelled projects. Our government is about getting shovels in the ground and building for the future generations of this province, and that is exactly what we are going to do. With a 413, we'll Response. have shovels in the ground, and we're going to build this 52-kilometer long highway. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Please stop the clock. We are 15 minutes into question period, and there are a small number of members who are repeatedly ignoring my requests to come to order, like I'm not even here. I am here. 
we're going to revert to warnings if you, comple if you completely ignore my request to come to order. We know where that leads. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Halliburton, Fourth Lakes Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Ontarians need access to affordable electricity. They never want to return to the days of the skyrocketing hydro rates we had under the previous Liberal government. Speaker, people want their homes and their businesses powered by clean and sustainable power. At the same time, they also want to be sure that our government continues to fight the costly Liberal carbon tax and keep costs low. Speaker, can the minister share with this House what our government is doing to ensure Ontarians have clean, reliable and emission-free energy while the opposition wants to take a step backwards and lean on a terrible carbon tax? The Minister of Energy. Thanks very much. Thanks to the great member from Halliburton Court, the Lakes Brock, for the question this morning. Uh, we are continuing to increase the province's supply of clean, affordable, reliable, and safe nuclear power in the member's own region, Mr. Speaker, uh, with four small modular reactors, world-leading small modular reactors that are going in at the Darlington OPG site. We're refurbishing the can-do reactors that are there, OPG and our building trades and skilled trades workers and engineers are ensuring that those refurbishments aren't just on time and on budget, they're actually ahead of schedule and on budget, Mr. Speaker, which is a tremendous success story, and that's given us the confidence to move forward on the refurbishment of the Pickering nuclear generating station. And just yesterday, I was down announcing a $1 billion refurbishment of the Sir Adam Beck hydroelectric facility wow. in Niagara Falls. Clean, reliable yes. water power for our province's future. We're building out a clean grid, but it's the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crosby and Crombie and her friend Justin Trudeau that are increasing the carbon tax, driving people into poverty, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary, the member for Halbert and Fourth Lakes Trust. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister of Energy for his incredible work. And I am very proud of our government's continued advocacy for Ontario's incredible nuclear industry and the skilled tradespeople that work in it, many of them from my riding of Halliburton Court, the Lakes Brock. We know that these refurbishments are massive undertakings, and by completing them ahead of schedule and on budget, we are demonstrating that major energy infrastructure projects can be built here in Ontario on time and on on budget. That's why it's disappointing to see the opposition completely neglect Ontario's nuclear, nuclear industry. Speaker. They would rather support a regressive carbon tax that punishes hardworking individuals and families in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister explain what the NDP and Liberal opposition to our nuclear sector means for our Ontario skilled nuclear workforce and the businesses that make up our nuclear supply chain? I bet you he can. Of energy. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker, and we certainly know the NDP energy critic stance when it comes to nuclear power. Mr. Speaker, they're against nuclear power. 76,000 people are working in Canada's nuclear sector every day, and 68,000 of them are working in Ontario's sector in the supply chain and operating the plants. Mr. Speaker, those are hardworking people, skilled trades, engineers, plant operators that pay, get good paychecks every single day, and they're providing. Almost 60 per cent of the province's baseload power, clean, reliable, affordable electricity. It's our party, it's our government under the leadership of Premier Ford that is supporting not just the current crop of skilled trades workers and nuclear operators, but those who are training to become nuclear engineers at our universities and are going to be operating the new can-do or large nuclear plants that are being built at Bruce Spons. and the small modular reactors, which are world-leading in the G7 that are coming online later this decade that are going to continue to provide our province with the clean, reliable, affordable electricity that we'll be able to count on for decades to come. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. This week is National Medical Laboratory Week, Speaker. And instead of celebrating their important work, the Conservative government is discussing the potential closure of six of the 11 Public Health Ontario labs. Those are labs in Timmins, Sault Ste. Marie, Aurelia, Hamilton, Kingston, and Peterborough. The mission of Public Health Ontario is to enable informed decisions, get actions that protect and promote health, and contribute to reducing health inequities. Closing six of 11 community-based PHO labs goes against that mission. Many of these labs are hundreds of kilometres 
several hours from the next closest location. Closing public labs will increase health inequities. It will endanger northern and rural families. We deserve access to the free diagnostic testing needed to be healthy. Speaker, not everyone in Ontario knows where Walkerton is, but we all remember what Walkerton was. Seven people died. 2,300 people became ill. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier learn from Walkerton and keep these labs open? Yes or no? The Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Perhaps the member opposite wasn't here yesterday when I answered this question very clearly. And because we have the benefit of Hansard, I will repeat that answer. Let me be clear as I can possibly be. There is no one in the province of Ontario or in this legislature who believes that putting well water testing at risk is on the table. I want to be very clear on this matter. Of course, the Ministry of Health funds Public Health Ontario to provide testing services for individuals who rely on private drinking water systems to serve our households. We all know that. The Ministry has not made any decisions about changes to the provincial well water testing programs, including which lab laboratories conduct testing or water samples. Order. I want to be very clear. There has been no changes. Yes, it is Medical Lab Technology Week today, and you know Spons. we have a learn and stay program. Order. The supplementary question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Hamilton Public Health Labs completes thousands of water samples and timely sensitive medical tests every day and often takes overflow from other locations that are beyond capacity. In fact, Hamilton has, Lab has one of the largest workload volumes in the province, which includes water testing for more than 11,000 private residents and hundreds of beaches. And yet, closure is looming. The province should be improving access to health care and increasing our public health capacity, not cutting it. So I ask the Premier again, during National Medical Laboratory Week, why are you not investing in our public health infrastructure, which is needed to keep Ontarians safe and healthy and keep all of these labs open? Minister Health. Speaker, 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 look at the numbers. We are investing in our public health units. We are investing in our lab techs, a critically important piece, clinicians in our health care system, where we've actually improved and encouraged through a Learn and Stay program led by the Minister of Colleges and Universities to fund new individuals who want to practice and train as medical lab techs in the province of Ontario. That's the expansion that we're doing. That's the investments that we're making. The member opposite needs to get her facts right and actually look at the numbers to see the investments that we have made, not only in the training, but in our public health system in a whole. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and my question is for the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, families and business owners in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore and across the province are concerned about the negative repercussions of the Liberal carbon tax. You know, they tell me this punitive tax is making their lives more expensive, from their heating bills to groceries and fuel costs. Speaker, this is unacceptable. To make it worse, the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, and her small Liberal caucus are happy to see this tax increase. The opposition NDP and the independent Liberals need to stop playing politics. Listen to your constituents and join this government and call for the elimination of this tax. Through you, Speaker, can the minister please tell this House how the government is supporting Ontarians by keeping this cost down? The parliamentary assistant, member for Oakville. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for a very good question. And if I could give advice to everybody in the chamber here today and everybody watching on TV, fill up your cars today. Yeah. Gas is going up 14 cents a litre tonight. And the brawny combi and the federal Liberals, provincial Order. Liberals, do not care. When we put forward motions and legislation Order. that would keep costs down for Ontarians, the Liberals showed their true colours by voting against every single measure. Speaker, even the Independent Bank of Canada has come out and said that the carbon tax drives up inflation, yet somehow the Liberals continue to support it. 
Instead, our government is focused on keeping costs down, extending our gas tax cut until the end of the year, helping families save hundreds of dollars. This government and this Premier are the only ones that are standing up for the hardworking people of Ontario. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. Karen, I want to thank the parliamentary assistant for that response and the advice to fill up our cars today. You know, the carbon tax harms individuals and families across this province, as many Ontario families continue to struggle with high interest rates and the rising cost of living. The last thing they need is more burdens. Our government, led by Premier Ford, has been clear from day one: we need to keep costs down and put money back in the pockets of Ontarians. But, Speaker, the Liberals in this House have refused to stand up with us against this tax that is driving up prices, and it's really hurting your own constituents. We know that they had a choice and they had a chance, and if they would keep this burdening, keep continuing to burden Ontarians with more tax grabs. As we know, the Liberals don't see a tax they don't like. They love That's tax. why our government will always stand up for Ontarians. We will always stand up and safeguard their hard-earned paychecks. Mr. Speaker, Question. I'm going to ask the parliamentary assistant if he can tell this House how our government is protecting Ontarians from new taxes on carbon. The parliamentary assistant the Minister of Finance, the member for Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. And again, a great question from the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. The Liberals in Ontario are taking their cues from their federal cousins and playing politics that are costing the people of Ontario way too much. But this government won't stand by and allow Ontarians to be hurt further by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, and our Liberal Party. Unfortunately, the federal budget yesterday did not eliminate the punitive carbon tax. Premiers from different political parties across Canada have demanded the government scrap the federal carbon tax, yet the provincial Liberals are playing politics and still not condemning the federal carbon tax. That is why our government is ensuring that no government can ever bring in a punitive carbon tax without first holding a referendum. Speaker, it's time the independent Liberals put partisan politics aside Stand with us as we continue to call to scrap the tax. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. The federal budget came out yesterday, and I'm worried Ontario is going to miss out because the Conservatives are failing to be bold on housing. There is federal housing infrastructure available for provinces that say yes to fourplexes and legalizing gentle density, which means this government has two choices. You can either continue saying no to more housing, or you can say yes to fourplexes to ensure Ontario gets its fair share of infrastructure funding. What is this government going to choose? Reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I listened to the federal budget yesterday, like a number of uh, Canadians across the country who were disappointed in what they, they saw. Listen, massively increasing taxes, not helpful to getting more homes built. Uh, 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 massive inflationary spending, not helpful to getting more homes built. Inflationary spending, which leads to higher interest rates, not helpful to getting more homes built. Uh, not eliminating the carbon tax, not helpful to getting more homes uh, uh, built uh, across the province of Ontario. Uh, no return, no path to a return to a balanced budget, not helpful to getting more homes built. What we saw in yesterday's federal budget is a government whose spending is out of control, not focused on what matters to the people of the province of Ontario, which is affordability, giving them the opportunity to buy homes and giving the people who build the homes the opportunity to build those homes. We need lower interest rates, Mr. Speaker. We can't accomplish that with a federal government whose spending is out of control and who will not reduce taxes Spons. for the people of the province of Ontario so that we can get our economy moving. They're dividing province against each other. That's not what a federal government does, Mr. Speaker. It's up to Ontario again to lead the way. And, we and the supplementary question. Uh, back to the Premier. What I'm worried about is that the Conservatives are forcing Ontario to miss out on needed federal investment to build the housing that we need for Ontarians. The Conservatives refuse to submit a credible affordable housing plan to secure federal funding for affordable housing. And the government is refusing to say yes to increased density to secure federal funding for infrastructure. Ontario wants you to show leadership on the housing file, and for that to happen, you need to make a deal. Is this government going to make a deal with the federal government, yes or no? 
Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've already announced that we will be working with our municipal partners to bring forward a plan that we can take to the federal government, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the reality is what we've done is unilaterally, on our own, brought forward the most uh, comprehensive, the largest inf uh, uh, investment in infrastructure in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker, because we heard from our municipal partners and from home builders that the number one obstacle to actually getting homes built is infrastructure, sewer and water, Mr. Speaker. That is the number one obstacle. We have a plan to do just that. The Minister of Infrastructure has brought forward the largest plan in our history. Now, Mr. Speaker, where the NDP can be helpful, but we know that they won't be helpful, colleagues, because unless it's increasing taxes, unless it's making things more unaffordable for people, they just talked against the 413, even though they got wiped out in the last election about it. They're talking against building communities, but where they can be helpful, Response. where they can be helpful is picking up the phone, calling Jagmeet Singh and saying, do not support a budget that does not make the appropriate investments in getting shovels in the ground and making life more affordable for the people of the province of Ontario, and we can move forward with the government in Ottawa. Thank you. The next question, the member for Orleans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontarians know all too well that the Premier's gravy train is running down the tracks and it's filled with his friends, his family, and his insiders. And in, in an attempt to make some more friends, the gravy train stopped in Ottawa a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, where the Premier promised to re upload Highway 174 to the province. The problem, Mr. Speaker, is that the Communications Department said things like potential provincial ownership of the road and that the deal would, in quotes, explore and assess the considerations related to ownership. Further, Mr. Speaker, the Deputy Minister signed an agreement, the Deputy Minister of Finance signed an agreement that says relating to Highway 174 in the event that an asset transfer is considered. <laughs> now, Mr. Speaker, that sounds like a lot of wiggle room for the gravy train to backtrack. Ottawans know that the Premier often likes, often likes to Question. say one thing while his government does something else. So will the Premier commit, yes or no, to uploading Highway 174 back to the province before the next election? The member for Nepean will come to order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing can reply. You know, Mr. Speaker, I absolutely love having this, this Liberal Party here because they highlight every single day why they will never ever form another government. Now, we went to Ottawa, we signed a new deal with Ottawa, which was roundly app applauded by the mayor of Ottawa, which was applauded by the community as a whole, Mr. Speaker. Now, I'm trying to. The, a guy who built a train in Ottawa that does not work is giving us advice on infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, coming from a party who, when asked to build bridges in the province of Ontario, built them upside down, Mr. Speaker. So I'll tell you what we'll do. I, I can't hear you. Yep. The member for Ottawa South is warned. My patience is exhausted. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, my question is for the Premier. Uh, the Premier and his government and too many politicians in Ottawa are grasping at straws if they think that a fake deal to upload Highway 174 that won't happen for years is going to convince anyone. Now, Mr. Speaker, Order. just about two years ago, the government published the transportation plan for Eastern Ontario. It's 35 pages on how the government plans to prepare for the future, connect people, improve safety, and etc. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? You know what there's no mention of in that transportation plan for the future of Eastern Ontario? Highway 174, Mr. Speaker. Highway 174 and 17, which connects Eastern Ontario from Hawkesbury through Alfred and Wendover and Rockland and Cumberland and Orleans and all the way into Ottawa, not a single mention in the master transportation plan for the province. Mr. Speaker, since the government, since the Premier Question. won't commit to uploading the highway before the next election, will his government commit <laughs> to updating the plan to ensure that the improvements that are needed for 174 actually happen? The member for Nepean is warned. 
The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing can reply. Again, sir, Mr. Speaker, not only are we going to upload Highway 174, we're going to make sure that transit and transportation in Ottawa actually works, Mr. Speaker. Now, for 15 years, the members opposite had the opportunity to do anything, but they did nothing. But we're not only doing that. On the advice, of course, of the members of Parliament, provincial Parliament from the Ottawa area, we heard that the need to make investments in law and order in, in some of the parts of, of Ottawa in social housing in those areas. I want to thank the member for uh, for Nepean uh, uh, and for Carlton for bringing those uh, those forward. They played a critical role in helping us negotiate a deal with the City of Ottawa, which the City of Ottawa has said will move that city forward, will ensure that we have a national capital that we can continue to all be proud of, Mr. Speaker. We'll have safer communities. We'll have better transit transportation. The member for Nepean was fighting for how many years to get an exchange? Uh, uh, an interchange off of what was it? Barnsdale. Uh, the, the, Barnsdale. the Barnsdale. Barnsdale. You know who wouldn't build a Barnsdale exit, Mr. Speaker? It was the Liberals. And now we're supposed to take advice from the Liberals on anything to do with transit transportation? I think not. <laughs> the next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, who is always bringing good news to my residents in Richmond Hill. I wish the federal government can also bring the good news to us by scrapping the carbon tax. Carbon tax is making life more expensive for everyone. Residents in my riding of Richmond Hill have raised concerns over the high cost of groceries and gas. They want the federal government to scrap the carbon tax, Speaker. Unfortunately, their plea fell on deaf ears. What worse is that under the leadership of carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, the independent liberals continue to endorse the terrible tax. While they choose to ignore the hardships of Ontarians continue to face as a result of the carbon tax, our government is fighting for the people. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is supporting Ontarians and making life more affordable? Minister of Energy. Well, I'm going to bring uh, some more good news for the residents of Richmond Hill this morning. Our government is actually trying to make life more affordable for people by reducing the cost of gasoline by 10.7 cents a litre. Now, unfortunately, I do have to deliver some bad news, but it's not because of anything our government uh -oh. is doing, Mr. Speaker. If you heard uh, the organization this morning, Canadians for Affordable Energy on news, on TV and radio this morning, they're talking about a 14 cent jump at the pumps tonight, uh -oh. Mr. Speaker. Now, part of this is because of the federal carbon tax that pump. increased a couple of weeks oh. ago. A carbon tax that Justin you Trudeau, when he stop. had the opportunity jump to hit the pause button or take off of the uh, cost of living in Ontario, decided, no, I'm going to increase it by a whopping 23 per cent. So tonight we're going to see the price of gas go to a buck 80. About 80 on average across the province. And the teeny tiny Liberal caucus here is more than happy to support Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for all your insights and sharing with us. And we know it's really bad news as we go to the pump. Experts, provincial governments, and Ontarians have been clear. The carbon tax is making life more and more unaffordable. <coughs> Families and businesses feel the burden on the energy bills every month. Unfortunately, the Liberals are not listening, and they do not care. Earlier this month, they went ahead with 23 per cent hike on the carbon tax. Speaker, that is ludicrous. The last thing Ontarians need is another tax hike. The carbon tax must be scrapped. Speaker, can the minister please explain why people and businesses in Ontario cannot afford the Liberal carbon tax? Minister of Energy. Speaker, it's pretty simple. When the price of gasoline jumps to a buck eighty, like it's going to tonight, and that's with our 10.7 cent per litre reduction that Premier Ford and our government has brought forward in our budget. Yesterday, the, the federal Liberals up on Parliament Hill had an opportunity in their budget to provide some relief to the people of Ontario, and they didn't provide any 
relief, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Right. And now, as a result, tonight we're seeing the price of gas increase by 14 cents oh. a litre to a buck. Eight. It would be a buck ninety if we weren't taking 10.7 cents a litre, approaching two dollars a litre. But that's what Justin Trudeau and that's what the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, want to do. They want to make the price of gas more expensive. That's why they're putting this federal carbon tax on there, and the Queen of the Carbon Tax is happy to have that federal tax in place, Mr. Speaker. It's unacceptable for people who are living in an affordability crisis Thanks. in Ontario and across the country to have this punitive carbon tax in place. Do what we're doing. Try and make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. An Ontario family that has been waiting three years for the trial of the reported murder of their beloved brother has just been told that they'll have to wait another year. And this is because that, that is the next available date at the Toronto Superior Court. Last week, yet another child sexual abuse case was thrown out in the Toronto Superior Court once again due to court delays. This is all happening under the Premier's watch. The first step to getting help is admitting that you have a problem. Yes or no? Question to the Premier. Will the Premier admit, admit that public safety is in chaos because the Ontario courts have not been his priority? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and I, I read the same articles about the, the federal government not appointing enough judges, Mr. Speaker, but we're not going to stand by and let that be uh, the cause of anything. When we put $72 million into the criminal backlog strategy, Mr. Speaker, they voted against it. When we hire Crown attorneys, when we hire case management coordinators, critical homicide assistants, community justice coordinators, bail vetters, Mr. Speaker, Ontario Victim Witness Assistance Program, Mr. Speaker, they vote against it, Mr. Speaker. We've hired over 350 the additional full time, and we have done things that have changed the system, the digital evidence management. You know, we are the second largest front line in the government, Mr. Speaker, and our people are working hard. We're adding to their resources. We're making sure that they have what they need. Now, Mr. Speaker, when we, I can't even believe that the member opposite voted against supporting independent legal advice for sexual assault survivors, Mr. Speaker. They vote against every Response. thing that we do. Now, I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, what they what they do want, which is to defund police so there are less cases in the system, oh, Mr. No. Speaker. Supplementary question? Back to the Premier. If every excuse from this minister was actually tabled, it could fix the problems that we have, but the justice system is clearly on his watch is failing him. It's failing him and all Ontarians. Speaker, we have record high, record high historic backlogs. This is the worst record across the country. But this government works harder at putting out press releases than they do at fixing the courts. They search for old funding announcements so that they can re-announce them again instead of finding qualified workers to actually staff the courts. Nathaniel Patel's murder trial was delayed yet one more year. His sister told CTV, my life has been on hold for three years. I'm suffering badly from survivor's guilt. Now there's another weight on top of that. I'm not in a good place. Speaker, for the families watching, does the Premier believe that it is reasonable to make Ontario families wait four years for murder trial date? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, let me use just one example of what we are doing different. Back when I was a court clerk, the NDP were in charge of this province, Mr. Speaker, and if, and, it, and, it, and if the court collapsed in two hours, I got paid two hours and sent home. It was precarious employment, Mr. Speaker, and when they were done with what they were doing, the Liberals took over, and you know what they order. did? They did absolutely nothing. Well, you know what we're doing, Mr. Order Speaker? Water, we're offering full-time employment to those workers. We're increasing their pay, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure we have the resources in place, and it took this government to pay attention, to invest in the justice system, to make that happen. The member for Windsor West come to order. The next question, the member for Haldimand, Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Every single day, every single question in this House is met with the same response, and we see it again this morning, the carbon tax. So let's actually talk about it. It's a distraction from the real issues like the Greenbelt scandal, the health care crisis, Order. the $9.8 billion deficit, Order. the increase in the Premier's office staff, many of whom are enjoying an in income greater than a combined income of families in my riding of Haldeman Norfolk. In January, I launched a petition calling on this government to follow the lead of Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe. 
no response except for carbon tax referendum legislation that does absolutely nothing to help the people of Ontario today. It's a publicity stunt. So who is actually playing politics with the carbon tax here at Queen's Park? If the carbon tax is front and centre here at Queen's Park, then obviously the members opposite could take real Order. action. Speaker, through you to the Premier, will this government follow the lead of Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe, who is providing real relief to the people of Saskatchewan today? Order. Order. The Premier. They call saving taxpayers' money a publicity stunt. You know, Scott Moe is one of my best pals there. We share the same values. But if you call saving taxpayers the money by reducing 10.7 cents off the gas prices, when everyone's going to wake up tomorrow morning and pay another 14 more cents on top of the 17 and a half cents, getting rid of the license stickers, getting rid of the registration, making sure we got rid of the 412 and 418 tolls, that's a publicity spend. We're the only government in the history of Ontario that have never raised a tax on your parents, making sure they're going to have a job, the students up there, making sure that we created 700,000 new jobs, putting more money on people's tables, uh, kitchen tables, and being able to pay rent and put a deposit Response. down for a house. You call that a publicity stunt? By the way, you won't have a job next election. <laughs> Order. 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 Those kinds of comments are not helpful. Start the clock. Member for Haldeman, Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. I actually uh, accept what the Premier is saying is actually good news because he didn't say Ontario can't create affordability against the carbon tax, but all the tinkering that he's talk talking about isn't quite cutting it for families who are continuing to pay more, get less, and fall further behind. What this government doesn't talk about is that it has its own carbon tax on industrial emitters, a result of the scrapping of Ontario's cap-and-trade system. This government collects compliance payments from the biggest industrial producers of greenhouse gas and will rake in nearly half a billion dollars by 2030. What is happening with that money? Members opposite might find it cute that they count how many times they say the word carbon tax during question period. What I don't find cute is the families who come to me telling me they're choosing between heating and eating. If this government will not provide meaningful relief for Ontario families and has no other plan against the carbon question. tax other than to consult, it's time you stop talking about it and focus on the issues you can control here in Ontario. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe has truly taken Ottawa on. Thank you. Thank you. The Premier. Well, just to remind the member, we took the federal government to court. It was forced upon us. The carbon tax is the worst tax you could ever put on the backs of people. It's going to cost parents more money to take their kids to school, to take them to events, to go home from work, back and forth. But guess what? We're building Ontario. We've become an economic powerhouse under the li Liberals and the NDP, you destroyed the province, you bankrupted it. You, you created hallway health care, you didn't build any hospitals. We're building 50 new hospitals or additions. Order. We're building 413 and the Bradford Bypass. We're putting $190 billion into infrastructure to make sure people have an opportunity to get from point A to point B, but most importantly, we've landed $28 billion in EV sector, Response. creating tens of thousands of jobs. Over 700,000 people are working today that weren't working five and a half years ago under your watch. You lost 300,000 jobs. Thank you. Thank you. I remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor at each other. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Minister of Northern Development. The Liberal carbon tax is making life more unaffordable for all Ontarians, especially those in Northern Ontario. That's not a publicity stunt, that's reality. Northerners already pay more at the gas pumps than in the rest of the province. They need relief, not a punitive tax burden. As many Ontarians continue to struggle with rising costs, the independent Liberals and opposition NDP remain silent. 
They don't care that this regressive tax adversely affects Ontario businesses and our economy. Speaker, everyone in the province that has enough of the carbon tax. The federal government must scrap the tax. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the negative impact the carbon tax has on Northern Ontario? Minister of Northern Development, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, I just got back from Sudbury Nickel Belt, and uh, on beautiful spring day uh, in Northern Ontario, there was lots to say about that. But I think um, it's important to just uh, have some context here, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the nation was in, uh, in the grips of a soap opera called the Carbon Tax uh, Paradise, uh, Trouble in Paradise, last week, as, as Jag Meat was unsure of his commitment and Justin was confused with the position. The By Monday, a tired, broke nation from paying the carbon tax found out that Jag Meat reaffirmed his commitment, ah. embracing the carbon tax on families, communities, and businesses. The, ep the next episode started this morning. When Premier Fury, uh, sorry, Premier Fury from uh, Newfoundland, uh, said um, that he felt baited by the Prime Minister, oh, Mr. Speaker, he says he's being very sclerotic in his approach to this ideological marriage. Mr. Speaker, we've divorced ourselves from the carbon tax fully and completely. Response: We stand up for families and businesses in Northern Ontario who are probably looking at a two-dollar a liter gas Terrible. per liter gas price tomorrow, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Scrap the. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It is unfair that northern businesses and families are disproportionately impacted by the carbon tax. Rather than standing up for Ontarians in the north, the NDP and the independent Liberals are choosing to stand idly by. And like other areas in our province, northern Ontario has distinctive challenges related to fuel costs that need to be considered. While the Liberal and NDP members opposite continue to ignore the repercussions of the carbon tax on rural, remote, remote and northern communities, our government will not stop calling for an end to this disastrous tax. Speaker, can the minister share with the House the detrimental effects that the carbon tax is having on northern businesses? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development. A couple of important quotes here, in all seriousness, Mr. Speaker. Quote, it can seem punitive to consumers, unquote. Quote, so in that sense, it's not something I endorse, unquote. Who did these quotes come Who from? Who said that? Jane Goodall, perhaps uh -huh. one of the most yes. prolific climate change fighters there is out there. I've got all the respect in the world for her. I've met her, Mr. Speaker. My daughters adore her, but she gets it, Mr. Speaker. She knows that families and businesses are suffering under the pressure of this carbon tax. In Sudbury Nickel Belt yesterday, I spoke to a young, young couple who started up a new business, and they're bringing out all the trail groomers from ski hills and snowmobile trails from across northern Ontario, George, from Kenora and Timmins all the way down to Sudbury for repairs, okay? And I said, what is this cost in your business? He says, it's almost out of reach. It doesn't make financial sense to get this heavy machinery down to their shops in Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, whether they're steel fabricators in Nickel Belt or folks that do the real work, Mr. Speaker, preparing uh, for mining equipment. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Health, my office continues to hear from constituents, including seniors, across Niagara suffering through unthinkable wait times for crucial su surgeries. Elizabeth Cook, 83 years old, is in perilous condition as a result of a gastrointestinal issue that is causing fecal matter to leak through her reproductive organs. Two recent surgeries scheduled to occur at the Niagara Health System were cancelled. And she is again waiting for surgery after four years of dealing with intestinal issues. What does this minister have to say to Elizabeth and the thousands of patients who are suffering through unacceptable wait times in Niagara and across Ontario? The Premier and Minister of Health. What I would say to Elizabeth and the many individuals across Ontario who want to get their critical diagnostic and surgeries done faster is, first of all, why is your representative, why is your NDP member opposed to innovation in the health care system? Why does your NDP member continue Order. to rail against innovation in our hospital sector, whether that is expansion of surgical and diagnostic centres in our communities so that we, yes, can continue Order. 
to decrease wait times for diagnostic and surgical interventions. You know, it is really unfortunate that we have a member who represents a party who is diametrically opposed, philosophically opposed, to Response. innovation in our health care system. We need to encourage that innovation to make sure that your constituents, like Elizabeth, like organizations and individuals across Ontario, get access to that. Order. The supplementary question. Speaker, this government has had six years to fix it, and it's gotten worse, not better. That's not innovation. An Ontario Health Coalition report released yesterday uncovered the extent to which private clinics are using deceptive tactics to charge patients extra fees for OHIP-covered surgeries. In the case of con uh, cataract surgeries, they found clinics charging for extra eye measurements, tests, and special lenses, and unnecessary add-ons they say are better than OHIP-covered services. Seniors reported being charged for appointments, membership, and administrative fees for primary ca care, as well as user fees. Why is this minister ignoring the fact that seniors in Niagara and across Ontario are being ripped off by private for-profit clinics? Help. Speaker, as we make one change in the cataract and minor eye surgery um, space for expansions of existing community centres, we saw 17,000 people who had access to that surgery in the last year and a bit. That is the change that we need to have in the province of Ontario to ensure that people can get back to living. They can get back to volunteering. They can get back to driving their car. They can get back to reading books to their grandchildren. Those are individuals who access clinical services in community without the weight, ensuring Order. that they will be able to participate and be part of community. And again, I will say, you know, an organization and an, an NDP member that I'm going to ask the member for Spadina Fort York to withdraw the unparliamentary. I withdraw. Okay. The next order. The next question. The member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health Hamilton Mountain and Accessibility. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of hosting the minister in my riding of Essex where we visited towns like Kingsville and Amherstburg and LaSalle. It was an opportunity to gather with seniors from communities and talk about the importance of staying active and staying connected. Speaker, combating social isolation is important for the health and well-being of our seniors. Our government must continue to invest in initiatives that help seniors stay fit and active and healthy in their own communities. Speaker, can the minister share with the House what our government is doing to help seniors stay fit and active and healthy in Ontario? Great question. The minister responsible for seniors and accessibility. Thank you to the excellent member from Essex for the question. This MPP is doing marvelous job advocating for seniors. I was honored to join him along with the MPP for Windsor to come here to visit the new senior active living centers in Kingsville and Amsterdam. They each will receive $50,000 in new funding for seniors in the community. This means places like the Kingsville Community Center can expand their activities and allow even more seniors to participate. It was amazing to see the energy of the senior in Eskers. It makes such a difference in the lives of the seniors Once. when they come together. Here, here. Supplementary, back to the member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility for that response. It's great to see our government making investments that promote wellness and help seniors stay active and connected. This funding will lead to more services 
and permanent services for older adults in my riding, and especially in the towns of Kingsville and Amherstburg. Speaker, we often hear the minister say that social isolation is enemy number one for seniors. They need access to programming that enables them to be engaged with their communities. Speaker, can the minister share the importance of the Seniors Active Living Centres and how it is helping seniors in Ontario stay healthy and stay active and stay socially connected? Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Mr. Speaker, thanks to this premier and the hard work of the Minister of Finance, we are investing record amounts for seniors. We now have 316 senior active living centers. I travel all around the province and to see firsthand the benefits of these centers. I celebrate new center in Havelock with the MPP Peter Kawatha. I joined MPP for Innisfil to celebrate the new mobile senior active living center that will bring programs to the region. Mr. Speaker, everywhere I go, I see seniors so happy because they are active, socially connected, and Response. having fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In Waterloo Region, 770 acres of prime farmland in Wilmot Township are at risk of being expropriated for an undisclosed industrial site. Waterloo's regional official plan accommodated all anticipated growth until 2051 without significant farmland loss. This is very important for the people of the region of Waterloo. Yet, a month ago, farmers in Wilmot were offered an insulting cash offer per acre and given seven days to accept an offer or face expropriation. This government's current legislation makes it possible for what is happening in Wilmot to happen anywhere in Ontario with no transparency and no community consultation. Speaker, we don't need any more Vegas deals on Ontario land in this place. My question to the Premier, why is this government undermining farming, the farming sector and encouraging backroom deals Question. with developers. <laughs> Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Actually, uh, uh, doing no such thing, uh, Mr. Speaker. I suggest the member uh, speak to the regional municipality uh, if she has uh, specific questions. The, uh, uh, what she references in the bill, of course, uh, is uh, an issue that came before this House when the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade was trying to encourage the Volkswagen plant to operate or to establish itself in St. Thomas. The member will recall uh, that a bill was brought forward into this House seeking to provide uh, that community with the ability to provide incentives to help us land that. Uh, to the best of my recollection, Mr. Speaker, that was passed unanimously by all members, including the member opposite. So if she has a problem, if the member opposite in the party have a problem with what they unanimously passed, I would suggest that uh, uh, they chat with themselves about why it is that they would want to put at risk massive investments like the VW plant, like Stellantis, and all of Response. the other investments that we're bringing that help us create 700,000 jobs for the people of the province of Ontario. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.